half full. Raise your hand if your glass is half empty. Raise your hand if your glass has a slow and steady leak. <laughs> now, have you heard the one about the person carrying water buckets to and from the well? This is an old story. And one of the buckets was intact and the other had a leak in it and could not be mended and they couldn't afford a new bucket. Cried and cried and cried about how much longer it took to bring the water to the house until they realized that as the water bucket leaked, what happened? The plants grew up along the way. So I want you to think about this morning about how your bucket leaks, how your glass is full or empty. And I want you to think about the difference between being happy and being joyful because I think they're two very different things. I think I've mentioned to you before about the time when I returned to the church I was serving when my husband died. I'd been away for three weeks because he died on a Sunday. Then the next two Sundays I was off. One, I attended his burial in southern West Virginia. The next week I was uh, just needing a time to go sit in a church without preaching, without having responsibility. Went to the church I used to serve in Frederick, Maryland, hoping to just sort of slip into the back and sit there quietly. And the pastor said, oh, look, there's Terry and her husband just died. Everybody looked at me then. Some people said, we didn't even know you'd gotten married. I said, well, yep, I did, but thank you very much. I returned the next week to Harmony United Methodist Church, the church I was serving at the time of my husband's death. And I was the senior high Sunday school teacher. I had been for years. And you have to remember, when you're in a church, as long as I served that congregation, my high school class all started with kindergarten and first grade when I got to the church. So they'd known me a long time. I walked into the room and I sat down. They all stared at the wall. Nobody would look at me. I finally said, hello, I'm over here. And they were like, we don't know what to say, we don't know what to do. And I said, you have no idea what, how to react to me, do you? And they said, uh-uh. I said, let me let you in on a secret. If you know someone who has lost someone dear to them, you say, I'm sorry. You don't have to try to explain. We're not God's apologist. You don't have to make sense of it. You don't, don't, please don't say he's in a better place. Let me tell you, if you believe in heaven, is it not a better place? Duh. Nobody needs to hear that when they've lost someone. I said to them, if you mean it, say, I love you. And if you really mean it, you're going to do it, say, I'll pray for you. And one of the kids said, my family prays for you every night. I believed him. And one of the kids said to me, I did not expect you to be this joyful. Joyful. I hear I smiled a lot more back in those days before I lost my husband. But it was a good time to teach them the difference between happiness and joy. I was not at all happy. Happiness depends on what's happening around you at the moment. You know that? What, what are the things that make you happy? Santa Claus is coming to town. That makes a lot of kids happy. What else makes you happy? Eating chocolate. Eating chocolate. Amen, amen, amen. And what makes you happy? What? A Big Mac, a Big Mac makes Ann happy. <laughs> My dad were here, and it was Burger King and a Whopper. He'd amen you on that one. What else makes you happy? Family, Family makes you happy. Joy is not dependent on what's happening at the moment. Joy is the eternal presence and power of God and Jesus Christ in your life at the moment, no matter what you face. Now, this is what we're looking at in these passages we read this morning. I'm guessing very unfamiliar to slightly familiar to very familiar. Habakkuk. What do you know about Habakkuk? If you don't know much about Habakkuk, you are there with the scholars of the Bible because nobody knows who he was. He wrote probably around six or 700 years before Jesus was born. There's nothing really written about him other than in the rabbinic traditions. They did find a commentary on Habakkuk in the Dead Sea Scrolls, but no one knows who he was or what he did or why he was given this prophecy. Very short book, three chapters. The first chapter is he is whining to God. Anybody here ever whined to God? Because I know I have. How long, O oh Lord, will you let this suffering continue? Anybody see that with COVID? How long, O oh Lord, is this pandemic going to continue? When can we get rid of these stupid masks? When will we be able to be with our families and friends again safely? When will we know? When will this happen? If I had a dollar for every time someone asked me that, I'd have a lot of dollars right now. So the first chapter is Habakkuk saying to God, why? Why? Why are you letting us suffer? Why are you letting us hand, suffer at the hands of the Chaldeans or the Babylonians, however you want to look at them? Why are you letting us suffer? And God lets Habakkuk 
sort of bent his spleen. And then chapter 2, God is saying, well, you know, the time will come when I will return my favor to you. And they will reap what they have sown, just as you're reaping what you've sown now. But then this marvelous thing happens in chapter 3, and it's what we just read. Habakkuk gets it. He has that, wow, I could have had a V8 moment, you know, where he understands. What is it that he said? Though the fig tree does not blossom and no fruit is on the vines, though the produce of the olive fails and the fields yield no food, the flock is cut off from the fold and there be no herd in the stalls. What does all that mean? But that's where their food is. Even though we're hungry, Lord, we will rejoice in you. I will exult in the God of my salvation. God, the Lord, is my strength. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer. He makes me tread upon the heights. So if that one wasn't familiar, then we go to the one that's more familiar, Philippians. Was that a familiar passage to you? Especially that last line, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Say that with me. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Written by the Apostle Paul, one of his great Christological writings. The book of Philippians has that wonderful hymn. Jesus, though he was God, did not account equality with God as something to be grasped, but he emptied himself. He took the form of a servant, submitted himself to death, even death on a cross for our sake. And because of that, every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. But here we have Paul talking about what it is to rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I'll say rejoice, what we sang this morning, let gentleness, let your gentleness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Do not worry about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. He did not write this when he was on top of the world. He wrote this when he was a prisoner, a prisoner of Rome. And the key to the passage, which I think is one of the great secrets of life, comes at the end of the passage. I know what it is to have little, and I know what it is to have plenty. His glass was half full, his glass was half empty. In any and all circumstances, I've learned the secret of being well-fed and of going hungry, of having plenty, and of being in need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. doesn't mean you can fly if you jump off the top of the building. It doesn't mean that you will be the president of the United States or any other states. What it means is no matter what you go through in life, if Christ is with you and you know that and you rejoice in that presence and you give thanks for that presence, you will prevail. You will come out on the other side. Hard lessons to learn, especially when we are suffering. And then this passage from Matthew, the foundational passage of Jesus' teaching. This is chapter 5, verse 1 of Matthew's Gospel. This is the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount. This is Jesus calling the disciples and taking them up the hillside, and the crowd follows, and he sits down and he teaches them. And at this moment, you know they've got to be filled with all sorts of excitement and trepidation, everything else. They've just left their lives behind. They followed this man on the basis of his call. He doesn't say, look, I'm the son of God. Come with me and everything's going to be great. He says, come with me. I'll teach you how to fish for people. And they get up and they go, and he sits down and he teaches them. Great things. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God, or the kingdom of heaven. That's the one we always need to understand. The poor in spirit doesn't mean that they didn't have belief. It doesn't mean they didn't have faith. It means that they had come to understand that all they had in life was God. That's when you hit the wall and you realize, I can't do this on my own. I can't get through this on my own. I need the presence and power of God to be my strength. And theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. And we have all mourned. Have we not mourned? Have we not grieved? Have we not grieved, whether it's the death of someone or the loss of something we know? Blessed are the meek. They will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. They will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart. They will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. At this point, they might have known, what? Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. Blessed are you when people revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Blessed? Do you feel blessed when you're being persecuted and talked about, gossiped about, stabbed in the back? No. They must have thought, what have we done with our lives? What did we sign on to here? 
And Jesus says, rejoice and be glad. Rejoice and be glad. What is he talking about there? How do you rejoice when you're being persecuted and reviled? How do you rejoice when everything seems stacked against you? When I was in seminary, one of my professors, and she was Bill's professor before she retired, was Deidre Kreewald, professor of Christian education. You came out of her class working your behind off because she made you learn how to do a Bible study, how to write curriculum, everything else. You knew how to do it. She had me going door to door in Baltimore City when I took a course with her on literacy, knocking on people's doors in neighborhoods that had never seen someone who looked like me knocking on doors saying, could I talk to you about your children and their learning? And parents invited me into their homes and grandparents. I saw homes in Baltimore City with dirt floors and no furniture. We sat on crates and we talked about how they couldn't read so they couldn't help their kids with their schoolwork. Deidre planted all these things in me. She was also the only woman faculty at Wesley out of very few faculty women who were women at Wesley. She was the only ordained woman. And so she and I became very close. I didn't know that she had been married before. Before she was married to Jim Crewald, who came on campus to, he was a renowned organist and choir director in Winchester, Virginia, but he became the faculty person when our music director at the seminary died, very unexpectedly at a very young age. I knew Jim was her husband, but I didn't know until she wrote a book in 1986, the year I graduated from seminary, called Hallelujah Anyhow. Deidre entered the ministry, was ordained, as I said, not to be a seminary professor, but she was a local church pastor. She served with her young husband, who was also a newly ordained United Methodist elder. They were in their 20s when they took a group of teenagers to Mexico on a mission trip. So she was in her 20s then. She was in her 50s when she was my teacher. This happened in the 1960s, before there were cell phones or internet. They were working in a very poor rural section of Mexico. There were no phones there. And while they were there, her husband and all the teenagers they had taken were killed in this accident. Can you imagine not speaking the language of the land, having to find a connection at the United States State Department, having to call the parents when you finally find a phone and you're able to navigate calling the United States, coming up with the money to do that, to say to them, I'm sorry your child has died in my care. All this while you're grieving the loss of your very new husband. But she wrote a Bible study because she talked about her own journey. And it was a lay person who said to her, honey, you got to take hold of Jesus right now. Don't ever think that what you say to your pastor, it doesn't matter that your pastor went to seminary and maybe you did not. It doesn't matter that we've spent our lives studying scripture because sometimes our faith needs your faith to buck ours up and bolster us up. And this woman said to her, honey, you need to take hold of Jesus. So what she did was she opened her Bible. She looked up all the places where Jesus got mad and Jesus got mad a lot. He kicked the money changers out of the temple. And just, just to be clear, I was not changing money in the temple this morning when I auctioned off the bread. We were having a little fun for mission here. The money changers were making money in a really bad way, which defrauded other people because they wanted to go into the temple and make an offering. Jesus did not like that at all. He kicked over their tables and made a whip and struck them with it. Jesus cursed a fig tree because it didn't have any figs. He called people brutes of vipers. He got ticked off sometimes and he let it out. She looked at all those passages and she read them again and again and again. And then she read the part of Jesus going to the cross. After praying, Father, if you can, let this pass from me, but if not, your will, not mine. And on the cross, his last words in John's gospel, it is accomplished. And she understood that Christ had suffered and understood her suffering and wrapped his arms around her and 
she took hold of Jesus at that moment in a very profound way and wrote this story called Hallelujah Anyhow. That was the name of the study, Hallelujah Anyhow. There's a hymn in the United Methodist hymnal, or at least it used to be. I'm not sure if it's there anymore. I'll praise my maker while I've breath, and when my eyes are closed in death, praise shall employ my nobler powers. My days of praise shall ne'er be passed, while life or light or being last or immortality endures. No matter what we face, even our own death, the death of those dearest to us, we never face it alone, and that is cause for rejoicing. To rejoice is to express the joy that is yours in Christ Jesus. I used to have a little plaque back in the days, you know, when they had all these little hallmark plaques and little posters and things on the wall. Got lost in one of my moves, but it used to hang over my desk in every place I served until it didn't turn up when I opened the box. It said, joy is not the absence of suffering. Joy is the presence of Christ in the midst of our worst moments. Joy is not the absence of suffering. Joy is the presence of Christ in the midst of our worst moments. So here we are today, moving from stewardship, which is understanding everything we have is from God, everything we have belongs to God, and how do we use that? How do we care for it? How do we nurture it? How do we increase it? How do we share it to a time of thanksgiving? Paul had the key to thanksgiving. No matter what you have, no matter what you lack, You can do all things through Christ who is your strength. That's the secret of giving thanks, of always rejoicing. I admit I'm not a fan of Twyla Paris. I like her words more than I like her music. But thinking about Deidre Friedwald and the woman who said to her, honey, you got to hold on to Jesus. Twyla Paris wrote a song called Hold On. These are the words. We can hold on to sorrow, hold on to pain. We can hold on to anger when there is nothing to be gained. We can hold on to a thread at the end of a rope. But if we hold on to Jesus, we are holding on to hope. We can hold on to money, hold on to fame. We can hold on to glory, to the honor of a name. We can hold on to a thread at the end of a rope. But if we hold on to Jesus, we are holding on to hope. I'm going to give you some homework this week as we near the season of Thanksgiving. I want you to stop and I want you to think about all the times you have been blessed at the worst moments of your life, how you have felt Christ's presence surrounding you and upholding you, walking you through. And then share that with someone else, whether it's in your own family, but more than that, share it with someone who needs to know that there is hope in Christ Jesus. Let them know how you were brought through the worst moment of your life by the presence and power of Jesus Christ. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. And I can do all things through Christ who is my strength. Let that be your message and let that be your hope. Let that be what carries you through the darkest valleys you may ever hope to cross, knowing that it's the shepherd who gets you through. Amen.